So welcome for, to the first Ben Klevansky Visiting Lecture Series of the year 2022, um, entitled Attention to Detail, High Resolution Bone Imaging and Bariatric Surgery. And it's my great honor to, in, to welcome Galatia Kazakia from UCSF and our own Elaine Yu here from the endocrine unit at MGH. Okay, so um, welcome again. I'm Miriam Bradella. I'm the director of the Center for Faculty Development. And I, before we start with the lecture, I would like to talk a little bit about the Anne Klebanski Visiting Scholar Award, which our center started about a year and a half ago to help women who were disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And also even before COVID, women were less likely to be promoted and be visiting professor because of challenges related to travel. Then we saw the silver lining with the COVID-19 pandemic because most grand rounds in visiting professorship are now conducted virtually, which allows more women to participate in these lectures. So the CFD has so far selected 68 women, faculty, clinicians, educator, researchers, and postdocs who have shown exceptional promise as leaders in their field and who would benefit from national and international speaking, mentoring, and networking opportunities. And these women are now virtual visiting professors to give a lecture at a national or international institution, and that is organized by the Center for Faculty Development. Scholars also receive mentoring, professional coaching, and leadership training. So here. Just something about Anne Kabansky, after whom the award was named. She is the president and CEO of Mass General Brigham. She was the former director of the Center for Faculty Development and the former head of the neuroendocrine unit, a very successful NIH-funded researcher and strong supporter and advocate for women. This is the first cohort of scholars, and here is Elaine Yu, who was in the first cohort of scholars, and here is just an overview of some of the institutions where our scholars gave lectures, and UCSF was a very popular one. We sent a lot of um, scholars. This is just a picture of the second um, cohort of scholars. So now about the Anne Kabansky Visiting Lecture Series, that was really instituted to support and advance the careers of women at MGH, the US and abroad. We really wanted to give the opportunity to as many women as possible to be a virtual lecturer. And then these lectures now bring together the faculty members from the institutions that have hosted our Kabansky scholars with MGH scholars on topics that overlap both research areas and these lectures are open to both the MGH community and that of the host institution. And it's really meant to foster collaboration across institutions and of course to promote as many women as possible. So now it's my great, great honor to introduce today's speakers. Galatia Kazakia from um, UCSF, an associate professor, resident and director of the Bone Quality Research Laboratory in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at UCSF. And I have to say, I have a special affiliation to UCSF because I did my radiology residency there a long time ago. And her research focuses on the assessment of bone quality using both in vivo and ex vivo imaging tools and also spanning the hierarchical levels of bone structure and composition. Elaine Yu is an assistant professor of medicine here at Harvard Medical School and member of the endocrine division at MGH, where she serves as the director of the MGH Bone Density Center. And we have, we work a lot on the clinical side in that role. And her research is focused on characterizing the long-term negative effects of bariatric surgery on diabetes and skeletal outcomes. So now it's my great pleasure to ask our speakers to share their slides. Hey, thank first. you. Yeah, I'll be going first. Let me make sure you have a good view. How does that look? Great. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. I want to thank Miriam for the introduction um, and all of the organizers for um, including me in today's program. Um, here at UCSF, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with and Schaefer's team on bariatric surgery studies, and more recently have um, been involved with Elaine and colleagues as well. And so this joint talk is a really great opportunity to continue uh, and expand this collaboration. Um, we've broken this uh, talk up into two parts. Um, so I've been tasked with uh, giving an introduction to advanced imaging. I'm gonna be reviewing scalable imaging very quickly from basic to advanced. And I'll spend some time highlighting um, some details particularly relevant to longitudinal uh, surgical weight loss studies. And then Elaine will follow with uh, data more specific to bariatric surgery studies. 
Uh, I don't have any disclosures. So I always like to um, start with a graphic like this one um, to underscore the hierarchical organization of skeletal tissues and also to orient my talk in terms of the scales um, of bone quality assessment that I'll be talking about um, from the highest level where we're looking at uh, just bone mineral density through to higher resolutions where we can see bone geometry and even higher to bone microstructure um, and even to, to bone tissue composition. Um, and of course, data from all of these uh, organizational levels or length scales contribute to our understanding of bone strength and prediction of fractures. For this talk, this schematic is also uh, really, really useful in that it serves as an overview of the imaging techniques uh, I'm going to touch on. So DEXA uh, at, at one end of the spectrum through to uh, quantitative computed tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, and high resolution peripheral QCT. And you can kind of see the the length scales that each of these um, covers. Uh, so why, um, our, our, why is focusing on the assessment of microstructure in particular as part of bone quality? Why is that so important? Well, here's, uh, I think, a, an image that probably many of you have, have seen before, um, a vertebral bone from a young individual on the left and an older individual on the right. And you can see, of course, um, not only a loss of bone in general, but a, a pretty drastic change in microstructure. So loss of trabeculae, loss of connectivity, a change in the shape or topology of those trabeculae. Um, and this can happen um, even in a scenario where BMD doesn't change. So on the right, I'm showing here two individuals, distal radius scans from two individuals who have identical aerial and volumetric BMD at the distal radius, but whose the, or, the organization of the bone in these individuals is clearly very different. The microstructure is very, very different. Um, and so this is a schematic that I like to show when I'm talking about the importance of microstructure um, and microstructural evaluation and paying uh, attention to details. Um, here, um, you know, this is helpful to visualize the impact and importance of, of structure. Um, we have two structures um, with the same amount of bone, or say, let's call it equal BMD, um, but arranged very differently. Um, and so in one, we have a greater number of connections, a greater number of struts. And of course, one of these is going to be much stronger than the other. Um, and I also uh, think this uh, finite element analysis is really um, a nice way to demonstrate this concept if we think about a reduction in BMD, a 10% reduction in BMD due to reduced trabecular thickness has a 20% reduction in bone strength. Whereas if that 10% reduction in BMD is instead due to a reduction in trabecular number, we have a much, much greater impact on bone strength. Um, so that everything I've talked about so far is really kind of focused on trabecular bone quality, but of course, cortical bone microstructure is also varied and affected by aging and disease and weight loss. Um, and when we first started up our high resolution peripheral QCT imaging program, we started to see a lot of these examples of different kinds of porosity, different spatial distribution of porosity, um, uh, shapes and sizes. And um, of course, this was very interesting, both kind of biologically, but also from a biomechanics perspective, because we know that porosity is a major determinant of strength, stiffness, um, and fracture risk in, in cortical bone. Um, we also um, can visualize now with the tools we have the expansion of cortical pore space over time. And we saw that porosity and pore volume, specifically in this example, were some of the more dramatic longitudinal changes. Here we're seeing uh, one individual at baseline and 24 months later, and you can see in green the expansion of that pore space. And we also started to notice that porosity increases could explain really large um, decreases in strength. Uh, we also know porosity is really responsive to changes in weight bearing. This is from an example, um, this is from a study uh, where we looked at individuals at baseline and then after six weeks of disuse, and we, were, and we saw really dramatic increases in porosity over those just six weeks in these young, otherwise healthy individuals. Okay, so uh, now this is the section where I'm gonna do a whirlwind tour of bone imaging techniques, starting again from the lowest resolution 
um, DEXA. Um, so uh, here, uh, DEXA is a projectional technique that gives us aerial bone mineral density. We can calculate T-scores and it's used clinically to diagnose um, osteoporosis. However, um, this technique cannot distinguish trabecular versus cortical compartments, can't look at some of those details in terms of where um, uh, changes may be happening. Uh, we know DEXA is influenced by size effects, by soft tissue errors, um, and we know it's a somewhat unreliable predictor of fracture. Um, and here's one example of DEXA failing to provide an accurate fracture assessment in, um, in diabetes. We have seen that T-score from DEXA really underestimates fracture risk. Um, and um, our team has um, seen that that may be in some individuals related to um, some increased cortical porosity. Uh, so at the next level where we're looking at both um, volumetric bone mineral density and bone geometry, we have uh, QCT, um, right? So this is a volumetric um, technique. We can um, differentiate uh, trabecular from cortical compartments. We can look at BMD maps within each of those and within specified uh, regions of interest, um, but there's very little microstructural information that we can get from QCT. Um, MRI, on the other hand, um, can give us bone geometry and some microstructural information, uh, but not bone mineral density. And what I'm showing here are some really beautiful images that uh, my colleague Roland Krug has helped us acquire from the um, proximal femur where we can really see trabecular microarchitecture. And we've used this technique um, to look at microstructural differences, to identify microstructural differences in HIV positive individuals compared to controls. Okay, so finally, um, I'll talk about the newest technology and this is where I'll spend uh, most of my time. Um, this is a high resolution peripheral QCT scanner, the first, um, generation scanner came out in about 2005, the newest one in um, 2014. Um, this allows us for the first time um, to really get um, high resolution microstructural information in vivo, um, but it's limited to peripheral sites. Um, HRPQCT allows us to quantify bone density, geometry, microstructure, and um, this is what a scan uh, uh, a participant having a scan of the distal tibia um, would look like. Um, the first thing that we do is um, prescribe the scan with a, with a scout. Um, as I said, it's limited to peripheral locations. So that's generally distal and diaphyseal tibia, distal diaphyseal radius. The newer um, generation machine can get to the knee as well, which is really exciting. Um, this is a single uh, slice reconstruction. And then of course we layer um, these slices to get full 3D volumetric information. Um, there are routines um, developed for uh, segmenting bone from background, uh, trabecular from cortical compartments. And so then we can do some nice microstructural analyses on um, the, starting with the trabecular bone. Sorry. Um, once we have the, this trabecular bone um, segmented, we can uh, do sphere fitting within the trabeculae, which gives us a map of trabecular thickness, uh, like what I'm showing here. Um, we can also, of course, do this in the inverse space and get a map of trabecular separation um, like this. Then um, Ed Guo's team has also developed um, a topological analysis of the trabecular bone. So um, in uh, in ITS or individual trabecular segmentation, um, we can skeletonize a trabecular structure. Um, and then depending on the dimensions of the skeleton of each individual trabecular segment, we can label it as either plate-like or rod-like depending on its aspect ratio. Um, and this is important because plate-like trabeculae would give greater strength. Uh, we can also define orientation of individual trabeculae and that Orientation is, this, is correlated to strength measures as well. Um, and then going back to um, analyses, we can instead focus on the cortical compartment um, and 
our team has helped to develop um, the cortical uh, bone analysis that's now incorporated into all the scanful software. This process starts with defining the cortical uh, boundaries, um, segmenting intracortical pores. Um, once you have those pores identified, you can now quantify porosity um, and pore volume. And then we've developed um, some topological analyses analogous to ITS that I just described in regular bone, um, where again, we can take that negative space or the pore space in the cortex, uh, skeletonize it. Uh, then for each individual identified pore segment, we can label it either rod-like or plate-like, look at the number, volume, orientation of those pores. Um, and then we have also developed some techniques to look at uh, spatial distribution of porosity. So in this particular example, um, what we call laminar analysis, um, we are again, skeletonizing the pores then identifying where the center of mass of each pore is residing in terms of um, endocortical, midcortical, periosteal um, layers of the cortex. Um, and then labeling the entire pore. So now we can look at um, spatial distribution, relative amounts of porosity in each of those layers. So an example of how we might use that information is here. Um, uh, here we've applied laminar analysis to a number of different cohorts and I'm just kind of summarizing it here. Uh, in in postmenopausal osteoporosis, we see a uh, big increase in endosteal porosity. In type two diabetes and in gastric bypass, we saw a big increase in mid-cortical porosity. Um, and in that example of the six-week disuse study, we saw very much uniform um, increase in porosity. Um, and so I think this is interesting both biomechanically and because I think it is hypothesis generating about different um, underlying biological mechanisms that might be acting in these different cohorts. Um, okay, and then back to our list of analyses. Um, we can also perform biomechanical analysis or finite element analysis um, on the volumetric data that we get from HRP QCT, where we're applying virtual loads um, to our bone segment um, and uh, then uh, monitoring um, stress distribution um, throughout the microstructure, and then based on some. Um, failure criteria that we set, uh, we can determine uh, a failure and provide and calculate a failure load or strength estimate. So then, of course, we can also perform longitudinal analyses where we're scanning multiple time points, like that um, 24 month example um, that I gave previously. Um, another a uh, way that we have used um, longitudinal data um, is to perform endocortical uh, contour baseline mapping. So in this um, uh, technique, we have our baseline scan and our follow-up scan. We contour the, the, uh, con the borders of our, uh, of our cortical bone at baseline and at follow-up independently. And then we overlay the baseline endosteal contour onto the follow-up scan. And the purpose of doing this is to try to capture changes at that endosteal border, to capture trabecularization, particularly, um, that might be happening at that endocardical border. And so we've used, the, used this technique in bariatric surgery, and we found that following bariatric surgery, increase in cortical porosity is unchanged by applying this baseline mapping, in other words, the new porosity is not endosteal, it, it happens um, elsewhere. And uh, that kind of confirms what we saw with laminar analysis where we found that the biggest increases were mid-cortical. Mid um, and this is another example, um, uh, time-lapse uh, analysis. This was building on work uh, by Ralph Mueller and colleagues who first introduced it um, for micro CT uh, data in, in animal studies. Um, and then in XCT1, the first generation scanner. Um, but we're working to apply this to uh, the second generation scanner, which is higher resolution. Um, here we are overlaying, again, 
um, follow up onto baseline, setting um, a threshold and then determining which voxels have um, represent a, a increase in bone density and so uh, bone formation and which voxels increase, uh, represent a decrease in bone density uh, and that would represent a bone resorption. So we can calculate um, bone formation fraction, bone resorption fraction, total bone turnover, and we can um, you know, have a, a spatial map of where these changes are occurring. So acknowledging that resolution is still very much a limitation here, this could provide a sort of virtual biopsy, um, which would be useful in cases where traditional bone turnover markers don't provide accurate data or in cases where you want more anatomically specific um, information. Okay, um, so now I wanna look at some details that impact the accuracy of HRPQCT measurements, particularly in longitudinal weight loss studies. Um, and this is a study um, by Mary Buxheim's group um, where they looked at um, first a, a density calibration phantom with uh, different layers of fat uh, varying of, of varying thicknesses. And then also um, in in vivo scans, again, with just the radius or tibia, and then layered with varying thicknesses of, uh, of fat. And this is meant to mimic what we actually see um, in the range of um, BMI in people that are actually scanned in the scanner. And you can see that in the, in the image on the right. And so what they found was increasing soft tissue thickness decreases the measured artifactually, de decreases the measured um, volumetric bone mineral density. Um, and further, they saw that it also decreases the strength estimate and really pretty dramatically changes microstructural measurements as well. So we were simultaneously performing a very similar study, but our question was flipped. We wanted to calculate the impact of these soft tissue artifacts in the scenario of major weight loss following bariatric surgery. Um, so what we used was a phantom that represented both a, a trabecular compartment, a homogeneous trabecular compartment and a cortical compartment wrapped in gel meant to mimic uh, muscle tissue and then wrapped in fat. And that's what you see on the left there. And what we found was with um, decreasing soft tissue thickness, now we're talking about the scenario of weight loss over time, decreasing soft tissue thickness, increases our measured BBMD, and it was much more dramatic in the cortical versus the trabecular compartment. And then we applied um, a correction factor from those phantom data to uh, real data that we acquired in bariatric surgery uh, patients. And um, that's what you're seeing here. So case one through five are five individuals who uh, underwent bariatric surgery. In blue, we have the original changes in volumetric BMD, total, cortical, trabecular. Um, and then we applied a correction factor based on the artifact that we know occurs just due to change in soft tissue alone. And um, that's what you see in orange. And so what we found is that the decrease in soft tissue thickness underestimates bone loss and longitudinal data. And again, this is most severe in cortical data. Okay, so now I just uh, wanna take a few minutes to mention the Extreme CT um, 2 second generation scanner and some work that we're doing um, bringing our scanner online. Um, this scanner, um, as I mentioned, now um, can also scan uh, the knee joint, um, but it's pri the primary change is that it's a higher resolution scanner. And so you can see at the bottom uh, some spatial phantom um, images scanned at 82 microns in the original XCT1 system and at 61 microns in the XCT2 system. And you can, I think, like visually appreciate the difference in that resolution. Our system took a while, uh, took us a while to get through the S10 um, process. Um, ours was installed and we were very excited about it um, in February, 2020. And then, um, you know, things slowed down a little bit. But nevertheless, we have um, been pushing forward with um, some uh, uh, calibration studies and, um, uh, and accuracy studies 
uh, we want to compare uh, data from our QC, uh, from our Extreme CT2 to our Extreme CT1 because we have them both in operation right now. We have some longitudinal studies that we anticipate uh, having to move over and we want to be prepared. Um, so here are some comparisons of the grayscale images from the uh, XCT1 at A2 microns on top. This is a distal radius scan and XCT2 at 61 microns at the bottom. And if your monitor resolution is good enough and my image is good enough, you should be able to appreciate um, a, a pretty noticeable difference, a uh, sharper image from the XCT2. Unfortunately, when we look at um, the segmented data, we notice that in the XCT2, we're actually losing a lot of details, um, a lot of the fine details. So the, the finer trabeculae are, are dropping out, the thicker trabeculae are being enhanced even thicker um, than we think they should be. We're losing a lot of detail in the cortical bone as well. And so we've been working on, um, uh, the reason for this is uh, that there was a change in the image processing um, procedure. Um, and so we have been working on optimizing um, a different image processing procedure, uh, which we are um, preparing to um, publish. Um, we'll publish a proposed alternative image processing um, pipeline that rescues um, some of those finer details and provides, we think, a more accurate segmentation. Um, so this was an example in the radius. Here's uh, another example, uh, very similar in the tibia, where again, we're losing some of the fine details, losing um, some of the cortical porosity um, in, uh, information, and that can be rescued um, with a better image processing pipeline. Um, because of those differences in segmentation that I just um, showed you, uh, we do see quantitative uh, differences in the data analysis. So you can see um, similar to what I was just describing, um, the extreme CT2 uh, cortical porosity measures are underestimated compared to XCT1. Uh, trabecular number is underestimated compared to XCT1. Um, trabecular thickness is overestimated. Um, so that's all uh, very consistent with what we just saw. Okay, so. Um, uh, just to conclude, um, I've talked about um, advanced analyses um, that can provide insight into scalable changes in biological mechanisms. Um, I've talked about the impact of weight loss and bone quality measurements. Um, and we saw that weight loss can lead to underestimation of um, bone loss in longitudinal studies. Um, and I talked about the impact of scanner and image processing specifics on bone quality measurements. Um, and uh, you know, the take home from there is just that we must take care to standardize and calibrate scanners and processing protocols for longitudinal studies, particularly um, those where um, we have uh, dramatic changes in weight. Um, so I wanna thank my fantastic team of musculoskeletal um, imaging experts here at UCSF, in particular, uh, my postdocs, Po Hong Wu and Sagi Sadugi. I have um, great collaborators, and I'm really grateful to my funding sources. Um, and hopefully I haven't taken up too much time. Great, thank you so much. So we were thinking about um, holding the question till the end, but there are two in the chat and maybe um, while Elaine is bringing up her slides, Gladi, if you could answer them, how does the time-lapse analysis take into account changes in mineralization? That was the first one, if you want to answer that. Yeah, I mean, a change in mineralization would show up as an as if it's, you know, beyond a certain threshold that we're we're setting with some reproducibility data. Um, it would show up as uh, bone formation, um, and and we would be able to localize that. Mm -hmm. And the second one with added soft tissue thickness, what is the reason for the impact on the uncertainties of BMD estimation? Was BMD estimation coming from CT numbers, which was affected by the object size image? Right, so it's a number of factors. It's, um, it is uh, beam hardening, it is scatter. Um, I think those are the kind of two biggest influences. So any, you know, any material on the beam path is gonna change um, both of those um, phenomena and those are going to change the, the 
the, the what's read at the detector and what the um, reconstruction tells us is in those bone voxels. Great, thank you. Uh, we can, why don't we uh, continue with Elaine and then if there are more questions at the end, we can answer those. So Elaine, please take it away. Thank you, Miriam, so much. And also, I'm honored to be part of this Anne Klebanski Scholars Program as well, especially given uh, Anne Klebanski's provenance in the endocrine division um, before she went on to bigger and better things. <laughs> but um, at the same time, I'm also delighted to be following um, Dr. Kozaki's talk, who really provided a be beautiful overview and illustration of the power of these high resolution bone imaging techniques. And um, my task for the rest of uh, the time is to uh, apply these techniques to the particular question of skeletal health after bariatric surgery. So that is what I will be discussing. All right, so um, let me minimize this here. Um, in terms of my financial disclosures, I do want to point out that I am the PI of an investigator initiated research grant from Amgen, specifically um, looking at, uh, it's an interventional trial in bariatric surgery patients, but I will not be discussing the results of this trial um, during this talk. So in the remaining time, what I'd like to review is to both illustrate the advantages of high resolution imaging techniques to in the investigation of skeletal health after bariatric surgery, uh, to review uh, bone findings from our long-term studies of bariatric surgery patients, and also to discuss uh, potential clinical implications of this bariatric surgery induced skeletal change. So to start off with, um, uh, again, Galati has already reviewed the differences between DEXA and some of these high resolution imaging techniques, but I also wanna talk about some of the technical limitations of DEXA. So in addition to only being a 2D image as opposed to our 3D um, uh, views in our CT based techniques, there are also certain limitations that have to do with how the um, bone images are acquired. And in particular, there is artifact um, similar to what you saw with HRPQCT, there's also similar in actually worse artifact um, with soft tissue in the setting of DEXA. And that's because DEXA involves very low energy x-rays. And these low energy x-rays lead to um, decreased penetration when you have the presence of a lot of soft tissue. So here you have a lumbar spine from a patient with a normal BMI, and then a lumbar spine image um, via DEXA in a patient with high BMI. And you can already see the graininess of the, of the image in the patient with a higher BMI. Um, um, and in, in addition to that, it also leads to actual alterations in the uh, bone density measurements. And that's illustrated here in this um, uh, very straightforward, but I think very illustrative study, which is a study of 127 adults with obesity. And these were adults with obesity who actually had abdominal panis that when lying down would actually overlay the proximal femur, including the regions of interest that we look at um, with DEXA. And so they did a, a, a straightforward study of scanning these patients twice, one with the panis overlying the region of interest, and then another time with the panis retracted. And here is just in uh, panel A, you can see um, this here is actually abdominal panis that's overlying the femoral head. And then this line here is likely a thigh crease. And so with retraction, you can remove some of this excess soft tissue. And just by the simple case of retracting this tissue, there was actually a large change in bone density. It was either, it was unpredictable whether it went up or went down. So it's not systematic in any one direction, but before and after retraction, you could see a change which exceeded 4% in over half of the cohort. And again, that would exceed um, the least significant change in most clinical bone density centers. Um, and then surprisingly, uh, there was a change of greater than 10% in 17% of the cohort. So really in certain patients, uh, this can lead to dramatic changes in measured bone density without any true changes in bone density. And of course, that's of particular concern when we are dealing with patients who have large changes in weight, such as with bariatric surgery. So here's another study that we performed here at Mass General, where we again confirmed this uh, wide variability and in unpredictable um, increase or decrease in measured bone density with um, fat layering of um, 
of human volunteers by using DEXA. Um, and we also took the extra step of uh, doing a similar analysis by quantitative CT. This is axial CT, not high resolution uh, PQCT that, um, that Dr. Kozaki was mentioning earlier. But in this particular case, we found that although CT-based imaging did have some measure of uh, systematic error and the setting of um, fat layering and weight, cha weight change, that CT-based imaging in general seemed to be less influenced in the setting of um, excessive um, uh, soft tissue or soft tissue changes. And again, um, this is a particularly important issue in the context of bariatric surgery. Um, all of these bariatric surgery procedures can lead to really remarkable and sustained weight loss. In particular, um, in the interest of time for this talk, I'm going to be focusing really exclusively on Ruin Y gastric bypass. And the average weight loss that is seen in these gastric bypass patients is uh, typically in the order of 70 to 80 pounds. So, uh, really, a substantial amount of weight and soft tissue changes that could be occurring. Um, and uh, it's important to recognize that there's been a rapid increase in the utilization of these bariatric surgery procedures over the last 15 to 20 years. And despite the already rapid increase, um, we are still only reaching about less than 1% of eligible patients, uh, patients who are eligible based on BMI and comorbidity criteria to potentially receive bariatric surgery. So there is the potential for continued exponential growth of these procedures over time. Um, Another important point that I won't be able to go into detail during this talk is that these various procedures actually have differential effects on bones. So we don't wanna think of all of the bariatric procedures as the same in terms of their skeletal outcomes. In general, gastric bypass has the most pronounced uh, impact on bone health, followed closely by sleeve gastrectomy, whereas gastric banding appears to have um, minimal effects on overall bone health and fracture risk. So what are potential reasons why bariatric surgery might be bad for bone? Um, there are many putative hypotheses, and in, in the end, it may be a combination of uh, multiple of these hypotheses uh, that are contributing to the bone phenotype that I will be showing you in a moment. But here are the leading, um, the leading theories. One is that weight loss itself is inducing mechanical unloading of the skeleton. And of course, we know that um, with studies of uh, either bed rest and disuse or um, uh, or even in space flight, that you can have um, uh, significant impacts on bone density and bone loss in the setting of mechanical unloading. In addition, uh, these bariatric procedures can potentially introduce um, nutritional deficiencies, such as deficiencies of calcium, protein, um, also uh, calcium and vitamin D malabsorption. And there may be hormonal perturbations um, that mediate some of the improvements in metabolism that we see, but unfortunately may also have direct and negative effects on the skeleton. But regardless of the cause, um, we, we first want to uh, document the phenotype. And so early studies really focused primarily on DEXA. And by DEXA, did demonstrate that there was a significantly large magnitude of bone loss. But given the concerns about the impact of soft tissue on our DEXA measurements, um, we felt it was important to also look at CT-based imaging to really confirm or refute whether those original uh, bone density DEXA measurements in the setting of weight loss uh, were truly accurate. And so the advantages of CT imaging, and in particular high resolution CT imaging, are listed here for the bariatric surgery population. Um, there's the potential for improved accuracy in the setting of potentially large changes in body weight. Um, in addition, uh, these high resolution techniques can provide details about compartment specific changes in both cortical and trabecular microarchitecture. And um, finally, um, these imaging techniques may provide additional insight into pathophysiologic mechanisms contributing to the higher fracture risk that we do observe in these uh, bariatric surgery patients. So um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be, I'm going to be focusing really on HRPQCT results um, in our bariatric surgery population, and particularly a long-term skeletal health after ruin Y gastric bypass. So in terms of skeletal changes after gastric bypass, we do know that bone turnover markers can increase uh, and increase quite rapidly. In fact, even within the first week of surgery, we can see the beginnings uh, of a rise and it really peaks in the three to six month time period, but remains elevated even five years out after bariatric surgery. We do have um, longitudinal cohorts where we follow patients prior to bariatric surgery and for up to five years after their surgery. And this is the um, phenotype that we see. 
In terms of changes in bone density, uh, here we can see that there are um, significant declines in bone density in the five years after gastric bypass as measured both by DEXA and also by uh, QCT of the trabecular spine. This is on the order of about 8% of the spine, 15% at the hip. And of note, the, this uh, large magnitude of bone loss occurred despite aggressive calcium and vitamin D supplementation and stable levels of serum calcium, vitamin D, and PTH. Um, of note, um, most of the, the majority of this bone loss appears to occur in the first two years um, after bariatric surgery, but um, there is still continued and accelerated bone loss in the subsequent years after bypass surgery. In addition, uh, Ann Schaefer's group at UCSF has also um, investigated this question, and they have found in particular that postmenopausal women may be particularly susceptible to bone loss. In terms of our HRPQCT findings, here are data from the same cohort over a five-year period. And we did see indeed declines in cortical area and cortical thickness at both the tibia and the radius over the course of the five-year study. But unlike what you saw with DEXA, there is a continued bone loss throughout the entire five years of the study that is relatively constant. Um, and that's seen in some of our other parameters as well. Here you see a visual representation of cortical porosity after gastric bypass. Here you have the cortical shell here, which has been divorced from the inner trabecular core. And the cortical pores are shown here in this yellow green color. And you can see the um, great increase in cortical porosity at both the radius and the tibia uh, in the five years after gastric bypass. This is just using the standard measures of cortical porosity and not necessarily the specialized laminar analysis that uh, Dr. Uh, Kazaki had presented in her earlier talk. Nevertheless, you can see that this may potentially have uh, an important impact on um, skeletal strength. If you look at trabecular marker architectural characteristics after bypass, you see a decline in trabecular number as well as an increase in trabecular separation at both the radius and the tibia. And again, there seems to be a fairly constant um, change over the five-year period. And finally, when you wrap all this together into microfinite element analyses and look at ultimate effect on estimated skeletal strength, you can see that failure load here, which is a proxy for skeletal strength, declines at both the radius and at the tibia over the five-year period in a relatively linear manner. Um, and it's important to note that the fact that there is an equal decline in both the radius and the tibia, um, the radius is considered a non-weight bearing site, whereas the tibia is a weight bearing site. And so the fact that there are similar declines at both these sites suggests that there likely is a systemic factor at play um, in terms of the mechanism of bone loss after gastric bypass. And um, therefore we cannot necessarily attribute all of this to mechanical unloading. Uh, what about longer term outcomes after these procedures? Uh, well, we performed this additional study looking at patients who had undergone either gastric bypass or gastric banding at least 10 years uh, before. And in addition to looking at long term outcomes, we also wanted to ask the, the second important question of whether the amount of bone loss was physiologically appropriate for the patient's new weight. And so in order to do this, we recruited patients who had not undergone bariatric surgery, but who were matched for the current weight of the surgical participants. So these non-surgical controls were matched to the weight of the bypass patients. These controls were matched to the weight of the banding patients. In addition, the controls were matched based on age, sex, menopause status, and also race ethnicity. And what we found was that in the gastric banding patients, the uh, microarchitectural um, characteristics and the skeletal strength was actually similar in the banding the control patients, suggesting really that whatever, um, whatever biological changes are happening at the level of bone after banding are really physiologically appropriate for the patient's new achieved weight. But in contrast, the gastric bypass patients had um, significantly lower um, skeletal strength at both the tibia and also at the radius as compared to their matched controls. And so from this, we concluded that unlike gastric banding, bone deterioration after gastric bypass exceeds the physiologic expectations of post-surgical weight, which again goes to the hypothesis that this is truly a pathologic bone loss and that there are factors um, separate from mechanical unloading that are contributing to bone loss after uh, gastric bypass surgery.
Um, and then using the uh, more sophisticated individual trabecular segmentation analysis that again was introduced by Dr. Kazakia, we were able to look at trabecular morphology. And um, just as a reminder, again, plate-like morphology appears to provide greater strength to mass ratio than rod-like morphology and is highly correlated with skeletal strength. And furthermore, the axial alignment or orientation of the trabecula appears to provide greater resistance, especially upon compression or bending uh, upon a fall. And so uh, what we found was uh, here uh, you have a HRPQCT, just a cross-sectional image of, um, of a gastric bypass patient and the uh, age, weight, uh, gender, and uh, menopause status matched control. And um, in this um, column here, you can see the 3D rendering that also includes information about trabecular rods and plates. And in addition to the overall um, uh, increase in cortical porosity and decrease in trabecular density, density, decrease in trabecular number that are visible just on, um, uh, on a visual uh, representation of the gastric bypass and the match controls. You can also see that there's a preferential loss of the trabecular plates shown here in uh, the red coloring in the gastric bypass patients. So not only are you having a deterioration of trabecular marker architecture, you're actually preferentially losing the specific um, morphology of trabecular plates that provides the greater strength. And um, from this this, um, this just provides a quantification numerically of the plate bone volume fraction being 25% lower in the gastric bypass patients as compared to match controls. And also here, you can see that there's a reduction in the uh, proportion of uh, trabeculae, which are axially aligned in the gastric bypass patients as compared to controls. And both of these um, morphologic changes uh, likely contribute to the decreased uh, skeletal strength that is observed after gastric bypass. So what are the clinical implications of the skeletal phenotypes that I've just described? Um, we've performed several studies looking at fracture risk after gastric bypass. And as preface to this, just to mention that other, other groups have already defined the gastric banding appears to have a relatively neutral effect on fracture risk. Um, indeed, if you look at gastric banding patients versus obese controls, there does not seem to be any impact at all on fracture risk. And so with that knowledge, we use gastric banding patients as an active surgical comparator group and looked at fracture risk um, after rheumatoid gastric bypass as compared to gastric banding in a cohort of 42,000 uh, Medicare recipients. And indeed, we found there was a 73% increase in non vertebral fractures in the gastric bypass group. If you look specifically at hip, pelvis, and wrist fractures, um, we were most concerned to see the increase in hip fracture risk where the hazard ratio was 2.8 um, increase. Um, this is the increase in, gastri uh, in fracture risk in gastric bypass as compared to the banding group. So um, based on these skeletal changes and this uh, potential impact on fractures, uh, we do have various recommendations for clinical management of bone health after bariatric surgery. First, uh, bone density screening is recommended for high-risk high patients prior to bariatric surgery and for all patients after bariatric surgery. In addition, lifelong calcium and vitamin D supplementation is also required, and it is strongly recommended to use calcium citrate supplements as opposed to calcium carbonate due to the um, better absorption characteristics of calcium citrate, especially in the setting of um, bariatric surgery in which there is a lot of gastrointestinal um, manipulations. Uh, in addition, lifelong vitamin D supplementation is required um, at whatever dose is required to maintain normal vitamin D levels and also to prevent secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, now, there have been a handful of studies, including a few small randomized controlled trials that have looked at really intensive supervised one-on-one -on -one exercise programs and have found that these um, intensive programs may partly lessen gastric bypass associated bone loss. Um, however, even in the best of these studies, um, the bone loss was not fully prevented. And most of the studies still uh, indicate that there is about a four to 5% bone loss at the hip in the first year after bariatric surgery, even in the patients who received the optimal and were the most adherent to the optimal exercise program. So um, it is helpful, but it is not enough to fully prevent a bone loss after bariatric surgery. 
So of course that raises the questions of osteoporosis medications. And certainly in patients who have already sustained uh, clinical osteoporotic fractures or those who have um, uh, osteoporosis that's evident on um, DEXA scanning, um, it, it is recommended to treat those patients with osteoporosis medications. Uh, my personal clinical recommendation is to have caution with oral bisphosphonates in patients who've received gastric bypass. Um, that's for two different reasons. Um, one is that we know already that the baseline bioavailability of oral bisphosphonates is quite low, even in norm a normal healthy population, it's about 0.7%. And so uh, now when you look at a population where there has been a, a large degree of uh, gut manipulation, um, I worry that the bioavailability of these bisphosphonates may be even lower. Um, and for that reason, I would recommend that if you are um, advocating for uh, bisphosphonate therapy, that you consider IV therapy, although make sure that you do replete these patients with the appropriate calcium and vitamin D prior to um, a bisphosphonate treatment. Um, I will caution though, that we did perform a very small pilot trial here at Mass General of IV zoledronic acid. And um, we found that uh, IV zoledronic acid may partially suppress high bone turnover um, markers after gastric bypass, but surprisingly, there was an escape from this effect um, even 12 weeks after the surgery. And uh, we had concern, this was a short-term study, we only looked at six months, but um, there were hints that, uh, that IV zoledronic acid, again, may not fully prevent bone loss. Um, I have to admit this was a bit of a surprise because IV zoledronic acid is a really potent anti-resorptive and has been shown to uh, fully prevent bone loss and in fact lead to bone increases and many other pathologic conditions of high bone turnover. Um, but for that reason, we are continuing our investigations and there are now um, several randomized controlled trials, um, uh, both at out outside institutions and also um, we here at Mass General are collaborating with um, uh, Ann Schaefer's group at UCSF um, and Dr. Kazaki is also helping us with that trial um, to look at uh, various osteoporosis medications in different types of bariatric surgery. So hopefully some additional data on this will Will be forthcoming soon. But in the meantime, um, conclusions uh, are that bariatric surgery is a highly effective for treating obesity, but it does have the unintended consequence of accelerated bone loss. Um, and the use of CT-based imaging has helped to quantify the magnitude of bone loss after bariatric surgery to help characterize changes in bone uh, microstructure and to yield mechanistic insights. And in particular, I think it's been uh, very important uh, to confirm that significant long-term bone loss is truly happening in the setting of this large-scale weight loss after bariatric surgery. Um, even though we know that uh, some of our CT-based imaging techniques, both the quantitative um, axial CT and also our high-resolution peripheral QCT, they are subject to some degree of artifact from soft tissue changes. If anything, as um, again, as was shown in the prior talk, this may underestimate the bone loss that we're seeing. And so um, uh, I think that this really uh, goes to the message that there is um, large-scale bone loss that's occurring after bariatric surgery, regardless of which imaging technique that you use. In addition, um, this CT-based imaging has helped us to uh, demonstrate alterations in both cortical microarchitecture and trabecular morphology that we think contribute to skeletal fragility after bariatric surgery. And um, using this imaging, we've been able to, um, to determine uh, that systemic factors are likely to play a role in global bone loss after bariatric surgery. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, my collaborators and also acknowledge uh, my funding sources and uh, I would be happy to take any questions. Fantastic, Elaine, and um, thank you so much. These are really great talks, both of them. Yeah, if you can, sh exactly, stop sharing your slides. So I, we have a couple of minutes for questions and I see, uh, I just want to welcome the UCSF crowd here. I see a couple of familiar names. So great for you to be here. Kai, you have a question. I see your hand up. Please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Yu and Dr. Katakia, uh, very interesting talks. I have never heard about these topics before. I'm a medical physicist working in the scanner related issues. My question is, uh, do you still see there's a limitation on the current high resolution PQCT in terms of uh, quantitative accuracy? Seems like it's been affected by the tissue size, everything. If you have a wish list, do you want the scanner to be more accurate in terms of CT number? Um, if there's any kind of a future research field we can pursue, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, of course. If you can make that happen, I would love for it to be more accurate. And one of uh, one of the studies that I didn't 
um, talk about today was um, a, a very early study that we did with the same phantom that had a um, homogeneous trabecular compartment and a and a homogeneous cortical compartment um, of known density, and we were looking at accuracy um, of the scanner and how that varied for different um, trabecular and cortical densities for different cortical thicknesses. And I, basically the conclusion of that study was um, tissue mineral density values from HRBQT are, are not to be uh, trusted and we don't, um, uh, you know, I, we don't report those any longer. Um, and, you know, we spend a little bit of time trying to sort out which particular artifacts were in play there and trying to see if maybe with an improved beam hardening correction, we could fix some of that. Um, there, I think there's a lot of improvement to be, uh, to be done there. Um, and I think that's a great idea. And for the bone uh, marrow density, you look like the this kind of a binaural structure is a bone or air. Then you calculate the density, right? You don't. Do you even care about the internal subtle uh, differential between each tiny bone tissues in terms of the density themselves, like the local density versus the global density? Yeah. Uh, well, we're separating bone from background, so we do have to distinguish bone from marrow, right? Bone from um, muscles and tendons. Um, if at, at the micro CT level, we can even look at like voxel by voxel tissue mineral density, um, but at HRPQ CT, you know, the data is, is there, but not accurate and, and to be interpreted with caution. So uh, clinical, like for pathology, there's any base to differential the subtle micro structure in the bones, like a is there any value to study the change in that, for example, the tiny tissue piece? There's a change in the density itself. Like the change a, in the like, density of the tissue itself? There's yeah. definitely a clinical interest for sure. Um, so it'd be really interesting, for example, to see what is the tissue and the change in tissue mineral density um, resulting from some of the treatments um, that Elaine was referring to. That would be very interesting. And right now we we have to have a biopsy to do something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a new trend in the CT field. It's the photon counting detector yeah. will supposedly right. be less sensitive by the beam hardening. So it might give you more quantitative accuracy in terms of those. Might right. be a good research yeah, direction. Thank you. Yeah, great point. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Other questions? It is five o'clock, but I... Um, I was just so intrigued about both of your talks about the techniques and the technical issues, but Elaine, um, the new treatments, um, that is very exciting. So because we, we see it, we have the study in adults and adolescents and bariatric surgery, I think we can all agree it's bad for bones, but it's really helpful for cardiometabolic risk. So what can we do to prevent bone loss? Yeah, no, I think that's an ongoing question that we are trying to answer right now. So again, in this in this trial, this is why this is such a timely topic in that we have an ongoing collaboration um, with UCSF right now to investigate. In particular, we're looking at denosumab. This is that MGen funded trial that I mentioned before in the prevention of uh, bone loss. And we're hoping that with this um, even more potent antiresorptive that this might uh, uh, be helpful to fully prevent uh, bone loss after um, these procedures. But I mean, there really are a lot of different hypotheses that are out there. There are many other types of drugs, including osteoanabolic drugs. Um, each one has their own particular um, concerns and quirks in the setting of a bariatric surgery population, um, but uh, happy to, to take any, uh, if any people have any clinical questions about that afterwards, I'm always happy to, to talk about that. Thank you. Any, any other questions, comments? Michael, nice to see you. Thanks. Oh yeah, no, great, uh, great series. Uh, congratulations, everybody. Um, quick question um, to Elaine um, about the uh, factors that might lead to the increase in bone resorption markers. Um, I know there's there's a high interest um, in finding this out, and I'm sure people have measured right and left. Is there any hypothesis as to what circulating factor or what what, what it is that? leads to the uh, sustained and apparently hard to suppress uh, increase in bone resorption. 
Well, so far there have been more hypotheses than answers. And so I think it's been a bit of a difficult thing to sort out. Um, one thing that we've looked at in the past and in both, again, both our data and um, in H. Schreifer's data from UCSF have, have had some curiosity about has been um, the association of bone loss with um, changes in PYY. Um, uh, and PYY is a neurohormonal peptide um, that's secreted by the, the intestine that has direct effects on bone and also is known to increase after bariatric surgery. But again, um, it's really difficult to determine these, uh, the mechanisms in a clinical study. And so we're still um, working on animal models to see if we can determine uh, whether these things play a role. Um, uh, Beta Zahedi, actually, um, our fellow here presented data at ACBMR to show that at least PYY uh, receptor knockout, um, uh, the, the Y2 receptor didn't actually have, I'm sorry, the Y1 receptor knockout did not have um, uh, any impact on skeletal changes in a mouse model of bariatric surgery. But um, there are two receptors and one has more bone effects. And so we have yet to see whether or not PYY might play a role from that perspective. Thank you. It's an exciting field, actually. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Well, I would like to thank you both for these amazing talks and thank our audience for joining us at late here in Boston, not so late in San Francisco. Despite the cold today, we had, um, what was it? Was it minus 15 Celsius? I don't know what that is in, um, in Fahrenheit. Right? Cold. But very cold. Very cold. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all and um, see you at the next lecture. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.